Thank you, Mr. Swaggerty. It's great to be back to the Northview Leadership Program. I hear great things are going on over here with this. I was actually a part of it at the start, at the beginning as one of the facilitators. Great experience for me. But quickly, I want to introduce your speaker today, who is very excited to talk to you about sailing the seven seas of leadership. If you watch TV in Toledo, I think you recognize the face in front of you, right? I mean, who doesn't know Chris Peterson? Chris Peterson is here today to talk to you. Um, what you may not know about Chris Peterson is that she is a Sylvania Schools parent and had a, has a daughter, Riley, who is a seventh grader at her fourth. And Riley will attend Northview in about a year or two, so we're very excited about that. So future Wildcat coming your way. And another fun fact about Chris Peterson is she is a three-time Emmy Award winning broadcaster. And we have her locally in Toledo. That's pretty cool. So without further ado, Chris Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I prefer not to use the microphone if I don't have. I've got kind of a big mouth, so I'm hoping it'll serve me well today um, mm -hmm. to speak with you. Um, and I will just start out by saying what a great opportunity this is for you. I, I will tell you that I just finished my master's degree at Lawrence in leadership, um, and I graduated last May. And the entire time I was going through the program, I kept thinking to myself, it, it really has changed the way that I deal with people and approach people and the way that I look at things professionally, but just in my circle of friends and my family members as well. And I really kept thinking to myself, I wish I had learned all this stuff so much earlier in my life, because I'm, you know, getting up there, and I wish that I had had the opportunity to learn some of these things when I was thirty. So I think it's really awesome that you've been selected to be part of the Leadership Academy here, and um, that this opportunity is here for you, and I hope you take advantage of it. And hopefully, I know you've had some really great speakers, and some of the things that you hear here today will and it might not be something that you go out and use tomorrow, but maybe something that um, will come back to you sometime in your life as situations arise. So because my name starts with C, I kind of came up with this little program of all of the C's of leadership that I thought were important for people, and I thought that I would share that with you today. And the seven C's that we're going to talk about today are control of self, character and credibility, so you get another C there, commitment, courage, cooperation, which is also part of celebrating others, compassion and change. And we're gonna start first of all with control of self. I love this quote by Lao Tzu, he's a Chinese philosopher. You guys have heard of the religion Taoism, mm -hmm. Asian religion, and he's the father of Taoism. And he says, he who controls others may be powerful, but he who has mastered himself is mightier still. And I think that's very true. How can we be leaders if we can even Ourselves. We're going to talk a little bit about how to best control ourselves because um, it's very important that we are always setting a good example for other people if we want to be leaders. Have any of you ever heard of Stephen Covey and the book The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? They have a teen version too. Some, some schools use that um, in, in their leadership programs. But Stephen Covey, one of the exercises in there is that he asks he asks you to picture yourself at a funeral service. And when you get up to the coffin, you realize that this is a funeral for you. And there are gonna be four people that are gonna speak at your service. He asks you to think about what you would like each of those people to say about you. Because what he says is, the way that we live our lives, from this moment, from even before this moment, on to the very end of the casket experience, is how those four people are going to look back and remember you. And the decisions and actions that we do every day are going to be reflected in those comments at the end of our life and how people remember us. So that means you have to keep your emotions in check. You don't act in a manner that's inconsistent with the image that you want to portray. We're going to talk a little bit about image um, here. You always hear, don't judge a book by its cover, right? Not a bad time this. And I'm here today to kind of um, debunk that myth because I'm telling you that people do judge books by their cover. And you need to be aware that they do, and you need to be aware about some of the um, positive things that can come out of that. If you look at these two different scenarios, you know, this guy or these two guys are gonna, you know, go in and look for a job. Who do you think they're gonna hire? The guy in the tie, right? That's not to say the other guys aren't qualified, but what somebody is looking at and the image that you want to portray is that you care enough to make the effort to dress up and that you are putting your best foot forward with somebody. 
and they will recognize that. And it's not just at a job interview either, because there are lots of studies, and I'm not saying we're a suit and tie to school every day. There are lots of studies that show when you dress up, that you are more confident in yourself, that you better on tests. This is research, I'm not making this up. And that you are more of a risk taker and, and able to take more risks when you present yourself in a way that makes you feel confident and good about yourself. So again, not something to say, don't ever wear sweats in school. Just something to say, um, as you're going through your life, and a lot of people have college interviews and job interviews, and you know, I get interns sometimes that come into the station and they are dressed appallingly. And I just have to say, look, you can't come in dressed like that. It's a professional atmosphere. Just keep it in mind that the image that you're portraying is the image that people are going to judge you on, for lack of a better word. When we send, um, when I, if I was looking for another job, we don't send resumes, we send DVDs or a link to something that people can go to online to see how it works on television. And we're told constantly we have seven to 15 seconds to make an impression. So in that first seven to 15 seconds, a news director at some station is popping in my DVD, looking at it and saying to himself, yes or no, and he's either gonna pop it and not watch it any farther based on how I present myself in that first seven to 15 seconds, or he's going to continue watching based on the fact that he likes what he saw. So we do make those snap judgments. People, our image is very important, and it's something that you just need to be aware of as you're moving through your life. Something you guys have to worry about that I never had to worry about as far as image is social media. And if you go away with nothing else from my speech today, here's what I want you to take away. Everything you post on social media is there to stay. You cannot erase it, it cannot be undone. It will follow you for the rest of your life. And more and more, employers are looking at people's Facebook and Twitter pages before they will even hire you to see what kind of person they really are getting involved with. So if you're a person that is posting negative, sarcastic tweets, if you're posting all sorts of political stuff all the time, you know, employers are checking those things out. And those are things that are gonna follow you. And even your opinions at this age right now are not gonna be the same things that you think, you know, 15, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, five years from now, but it's going to follow you. So just be aware that everything that you do online is there to stay and it's sticking and it's gonna follow. I've got two examples to share with you. One is, both are from past summer Olympics, and one was Greek triple jumper Bula Papa Cristo, who tweeted during the Olympics, with so many Africans in Greece, the West Nile mosquitoes will be getting home food, oh. and was dismissed from her team. Swiss soccer player Michelle Morganella tweeted after a tough game with South Korea, I want to beat up all South Koreans, a bunch of mentally handicapped Greek it was also business. Now in the first instance, that girl had worked all her life to try to make the Olympics, barely made the team, and was there about to compete when she was dismissed because of her team. In this particular case, this guy had more of a ripple effect because not only what he did affected himself but got him kicked off after he had worked so hard, but his teammates then had to go on without him playing as part of the group. So what he did also affected his team. We have some athletes in here. Anybody on soccer game, basketball team, anybody? Yeah, a few. So you know what that's like. You know when a teammate's hurt or when they can't show up for a game or a practice, it hurts the whole team. And so that is just something to consider, the ripple effects of what you do and um, think about it before you put it out there. Something else that was never around when I was uh, your age, we didn't have cell phones. And you have to remember that cameras are everywhere. Everything you do can be videotaped, all you have to do is whip it out and start it. You know, and gosh, we get even news clips that way um, on the news from people who see things happening and just get their phones out and, and start it up. And again, you have to be aware of it. Let's so stick with the Olympic thing for a minute. Might be helped. Three months after winning eight gold medals at the 2008 Olympics, was at a party and somebody snapped a picture of him taking a hit off a bomb. Made the covers of tabloid newspapers all over the world. Because this guy was, you know, put up as a hero for winning uh, an Olympic hero. And kind of started.
started a little bit of a rough patch for Michael, um, where he wasn't even thinking about whether he, you know, he didn't know whether he was going to come back and participate again in the Olympics, which obviously he did, and he became the most decorated Olympian that we have had. Um, but that was something that, you know, followed him for quite a while. Hometown boy, Ben Roethlisberger from Finley, Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback, had two Super Bowl rings, millions of dollars, Partied in Georgia in 2010, was accused of sexual assault. Okay, look at this picture. Does he look like he's under the influence of something? I don't know if he was or not, but he looks like he was. And, and really, appearances are everything. And then I'm going to say, it, it makes it easier for people to think that maybe he could be guilty of the sexual assault as well, because maybe he was under the influence of something. And you see a picture like that, right? See, this is not a good image. And as his PR person, if he's wearing a shirt that says drink like a champion, is that really, you know, the image that you want to portray yourself when you go to a college party someplace? You know, no, it's not. And that's a nightmare for him. And that kind of started a little downfall for him. And he's had to fight really hard to come back up and build his credibility with his fans and um, the general public. So that is just something to consider. Next is character, and all of those things that we just talked about kind of speak to your character and your credibility. Oh, one more thing. I want to go back to the, um, to the cameras are everywhere thing. Because many of you might have seen over the weekend um, Casey Steubenville, or two Steubenville High School football players were just convicted of rape, where they um, took a girl who was passed out drunk at a party, and both of them raped her um, repeatedly and were just convicted of it over the weekend. And not only were they guilty and convicted of that crime, they took pictures of it and tweeted about it the entire time it was happening. And all of those tweets and pictures were used as evidence against them in their trial. So just something to you know, think about as you're moving forward. Okay, so character. Jackson Brown says, our character is what we do when we think no one is looking. That's when your true self comes out. And when you do, when you are faced with um, adversity or faced with a choice, and you do, you make a choice and do the right thing or the wrong thing, and that is showing your character. I have a positive story to share with you about that, the story of John Lear. You guys have all heard of Lear Jets, right? John Lear started developing um, Lear Jets back in the 1950s. By 1964, had sold a bunch of them. It was like a new thing. Every company wanted to have their own jet. It was to get you from point A to point B very quickly. He was doing great until two of them crashed under mysterious circumstances. So he grounded the whole fleet at great expense to himself until he could figure out what was going on. And he thought he kind of knew what was going on with them, but until he could take the plane up and test it, he wasn't going to know for sure what the problem was. And instead of getting a test pilot to do it for him, he did it himself. Because he didn't want to risk anybody else's life when he wasn't willing to risk his own. He went up, almost crashed, lost control of the aircraft, um, but was able to regain control and figure out the problem and fix all the planes. All the plane. Cost him a lot of money, planted a lot of seeds of doubt in his customers. And it took him two years to really rebuild his business back up to where it was. But he said he never regretted the decision, that he was willing to risk his fortune, his success, even his own life, to make sure that that was correct for him. Because his integrity was more important to him than somebody else getting hurt on one of his planes that he was selling there. And as a result, that showed his true character. So under adversity, we choose one of two paths, character or compromise. So what is character? Character is more than talk. You cannot separate your actions from your words. Your actions and reactions are reflections of your character. And again, it goes back to that control of self that we talked about a little bit earlier. Look in the mirror frequently to see that your actions actually match your intentions. You know, sometimes we lash out at people, or sometimes we react or act in ways that you know we think about later and we think to ourselves, yeah, I didn't really need to say that to her, or I didn't really need to react that way or that happened. Um, so just constantly have a check on yourself to make sure that you are doing and, and acting the way that you want. Talent is a gift. Character is a choice. If you're a great voice, if you have great musical ability, you play an instrument, if you're a great athlete, all of those things are things that you are born with and develop you know, over time. But it's a choice that you make to 
have good character. And I'm going to give you an example from basketball. UCLA coach John Wooden, famous for winning teams, one of the winningest coaches of all time, more championship teams than any other coach. And he also is a leadership guru, he has written many books about leadership, just passed away not too long ago. But when he recruited players, he wasn't interested in their statistics. He sent to their high school coaches what he called a character questionnaire. And on those questionnaires, asked about attitude, hustle, unselfishness, did they show up on time for practice, did they get along with their teammates, because he thought those were the things that were more important than the statistics that he was going to see in the newspaper. And to a man, the men that played for him felt like they were better basketball players because he emphasized the character. And not only that, they felt like they were better men because he emphasized character. And they were able to use those lessons and take it beyond basketball when basketball was over and moved on to other things. So character, very important. And it's a choice. Character brings lasting success to leaders. Followers will not follow a leader with character flaws. Eventually they figure it out and they won't follow you. You can't influence them anymore. James Cousins and Barry Posner wrote a book, wrote a book called The Leadership Challenge. And over three decades, they did questionnaires with people about what they thought were the best leadership attributes of the best leaders that they had um, been underneath um, in their professional careers. And over three decades, you know, um, charismatic, appreciative, you know, these things are kind of moving up and down the ladder. But without a doubt, across the board, the one thing that was the number one most important thing to people across all cultures, in different countries, was honesty. And that speaks to your credibility as well. Honesty speaks to character and credibility, which is something much easier to maintain than it is to rebuild, by the way. So when you're making your choices, when you're thinking about um, those things to do, just remember that you know, once people feel like they can't trust you, it's really hard to get that back. Leaders also do not rise above the character limitations. If you are not focused on character and not worried about what kind of person you are, you will fall and you will fail. And we see it all the time, people that we think are at the pinnacle of success. Bernie Madoff is a good example. Um, you know, had everybody fooled that he was doing this great uh, investment with all their money, billions and billions of dollars under his control, that actually turned out to be the Ponzi scheme, that he was using their money and getting rich off it and nobody else got rich. In the end, he fell. <clears throat> Not only did he fall, but all the people that had invested with him fell as well. He ended up in jail for life, and one of his sons committed suicide over what was going on with his family because he was so distressed that he and, he, that he and his brother had been working with their dad and didn't know what was going on with all of his people. So how do we improve our character? Well, there are some really good ways to do that. Look in the mirror when I say that I'm just talking about self-evaluation. Um, we all know that we have strengths and weaknesses. We're not perfect people. I have lots of things that I am constantly working on, and I feel like I'm a good self-evaluator. I have a lot of strengths, and I have a lot of things that I still need to work on every single day. So know what those things are, and be willing to look at yourself with a very critical eye and say, you know what, I can be better in that arena. Here's what I'm going to do to try to improve myself. It's real easy to point a finger at someone. When I was growing up, you know, when things go wrong, you know, it's your fault. Um, when I was growing up, my mom said, be careful who you point at because when you point at somebody, you have three fingers pointing back at you. And I kind of never really understood what she meant when I was younger, but it's true. You know, we all have to take our own responsibility for the way that things go, whether it's because, you know, we have treated somebody, because we didn't intervene when we should, you know, because we have weaknesses that we're trying to work on. Just make sure that you're more worried about yourself and the things that you can control and not pointing the finger of blame at other people. Um, learn from your mistakes. We all make them. If you can, um, oh, I skipped one there. I'll, I'll keep talking about the mistakes first. You can just learn from them, use it as an educational tool, and move on and say, oh, here's what I learned, and I'm going to try to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Then it's a great lesson. Seek counsel from a core group of confidants. You need to have some people in your life, whether it's your parents, a couple of friends, a mentor, a school teacher, who will say to you with a critical eye also, you know, you didn't live up to my expectation in that certain situation. Like, you weren't very nice in the home the cafeteria and that made me uncomfortable or it made me disappointed in you or whatever. Because we all need those checks. We all need those 
those checks and balances in our life to make sure that we're not just getting too far ahead of ourselves. And then offer sincere apologies to those that you wrong. If you do something, make a mistake, and it hurts somebody else, you need to apologize to that person, and here's why. Not only does it make them feel better and clear the air between you and whoever that is, it lifts that burden from your shoulders as the person who is the person that you wrong. Because none of us, as much as you like to push it down and, and sequester it and not think about it, you want to feel like we have been wrong to somebody. And it frees you and lifts it from you, and hopefully you've learned something and it doesn't happen again. Okay, next thing is commitment, and here's where it starts to get fun. Great leadership and success takes a lot of commitment, and sometimes you have to try, 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 try again before it comes up. Anybody here like Kentucky Fried Chicken? Since we're here at lunch, yeah, it's one of our favorites in my house. So, Colonel Sanders, the founder of KFC, started his dream restaurant at the age of 65, and he started it because he got a social security check that was $105, and he said, I can't live on this, I've got to do something else. Maybe somebody would like to buy my chicken recipe. So, he um, went door to door, sometimes slept in his car, at the age of upper 60s, um, for a period of two or three years while this was going around, wearing his white, white suit, famous white suit. Again, image, very important, as we talked about earlier. Um, asking people if they would invest in, in his chicken company. And he was turned down a thousand and nine times before somebody bought that chicken recipe and helped him franchise Kentucky Fried Chicken. Michael Jordan, love that picture of him there one of the greatest basketball players of all time. And he's famous for being cut from his high school basketball team. Cut from his high school basketball team. He wasn't good enough. And he turned out to be one of the greatest uh, basketball players because he didn't let that failure deter him. And this is a quote from him that I absolutely love and I hope that you love it too. He said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have all lost almost 300 games and on 26 occasions, I've been entrusted to take the game winning shot I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. So learning from this mistake, using it to build a fire and get better and improve itself. Walt Disney said all our dreams come true if we have the courage to pursue them. He was turned down 302 times before he got financing for Walt Disney World. And his quote here is very true. You have to have courage to be able to face that, um, you know, moment when somebody says no and face it over and over again, not feeling like a failure, but feeling more determined than ever to follow what we have to do. And courage is actually the next uh, seed of leadership that we're going to talk about. A lot of us might think of a police officer or a firefighter when we think of somebody who has a lot of courage in their jobs. And they certainly do. They're brave people that put their lives at risk, or a soldier, maybe. Um, but in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Profiles in Courage, President John F. Kennedy says that opportunities to be courageous are all around us every single day. And he says to be courageous requires no exceptional qualifications, no magic formula, no special combination of time and place and circumstance. In fact, he believes that we are all called upon to find courage in our day-to-day -day lives. And I can think of no two better examples of courage than two people that come right here from this building. And one of them is one of these speakers, one of them is Belgium. So you're young, 30-something years old, um, just had your second son, and doing great in your life, and you're diagnosed with ALS. And you know that it's going to kill you and you don't know how long you're going to have to live. And you know that you have these two little boys that are dependent upon you. And you know that every single day there are things that you cannot do and not do physically because ALS is going to eat away at your muscles and you're not going to be able to do the things that you want to do. And to me, to wake up every day and to say, what can I do? And to get out of bed and to face the day and to be the best mom that she can be. She came here every day to be the best teacher that she could be. To me, that takes a lot of courage. And that's really inspiring. So 
another story out of North Peak High School, Jeremy Diggle. Any of you know Jeremy? He's a hockey player here and a marathon runner. I mean, he left school, he's running marathons all over the country, you know, flying here and there to run marathons, doing really well, very competitive, ocean hockey down in Columbus, and is in a car accident and breaks his neck and paralyzed from his neck down. Can't move his arms, can't move his legs, can't feel And here's somebody that was really active, young man in his 20s, who now has to relearn how to do every single gets up three days a week and travels an hour and a half up to Detroit where he can do physical therapy, trying to keep his legs from having pain and trying to get himself to walk again with some special therapy that they have. And to me, that is nothing short of courageous as well. And I'm going to go back to Steubenville for just one moment because I feel like you guys are faced with these opportunities every day and you probably don't even realize. But if somebody at that party in Steubenville had had the courage to stand up to those two football players, if somebody had even had the courage to call their mom or call the police and say, this thing is going on, everybody knew it was happening. People were taking pictures. They were reading tweets about it. Nobody did anything. At the time, those guys might not have thought it was very cool that somebody did that. But looking back on it, where they are now, sitting in jail, and that girl with her life ruined, I'm sure that they would have been glad that somebody had the courage to intervene in that situation. And I know it's, it's hard being a teenager, and I know that you are faced with choices like that, maybe not as dramatic as that one every day, but have the courage to intervene. It's the sign of a good leader. Cooperation is the next one. And cooperation is very important too, and this is something that um, Celebrating others. You know, cooperation, when you have a culture of cooperation, it's we, 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 not me, me, me. When people are more concerned about what's right, not who's right. And when people are more concerned about the best way, not my way. I'm the leader. Here's the way I want to do it. Another, another thing my mom always said is you have one mouth and two ears so that you're supposed to listen twice as much. So if you are leading a team, you have a team, gather information. Get information from them. Listen to their ideas. And as a good leader, to find the best way to do something that's going to be best for the team makes you a great leader. Just because it's not the thing that you thought of doesn't make you any less great as a leader. Finding the best solution is it. Also acknowledging the talents and contributions of others. And I'll go back to John Wooden because when he was a high school coach, before he went to UCLA, he began requiring that when players make a basket on his basketball team, they give some kind of acknowledgement to whoever assisted in that play. It could be, you know, point a finger, fist bump, um, you know, a wink, a nod, you know, something to make that person understand that you know they helped you out in that situation. Because not only does that make them feel good, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel good to share it. It makes you feel good to acknowledge, you know what, that guy has gifts and talents too. It's not just about me. It's about the team. And that's another sign of a great Everyone contributes to the success of everybody else and makes people feel good. If you can find a way to make people feel good about themselves, make them feel like they are contributing to what's going on, they will follow you anywhere and be loyal to you as a leader. Next C is compassion. And to me, this might be the most important thing. I know you guys have opportunities every day where you can do this. And I want to tell you a quick story about Dave Kelzer who was actually, when he went to elementary school, kind of known as the stinky kid in his class. Um, because he showed up every day in soiled clothes, always smelled bad, sometimes tried to steal the other kid's lunch. None of his brothers and sisters were like this. It was just him. Out of the four of them, he's the only one who kind of acted this way. And all the kids, you know, they didn't to play with him. They didn't to find in class. The teachers didn't like him because they didn't understand what was going on. Come to find out after two years of this, Dave Pelzer was being severely abused at home. Unlike his brother and sisters, he was made to sleep down in the utility room every night. He drank with the plumber. He drank liquid dish soap because his mom forced him to. He um, wasn't allowed to go to the bathroom. So in the middle of the night, he had to go to the bathroom. He had to go in his clothes. And that's why he stumped all the time. And nobody ever knew what was going on with him behind closed doors. 
what I'm saying to you is, I know there are a lot of people, and you know, you walk around, you'll say that guy's weird, that girl's weird, you know, whatever. Why is she weird? Um, until you walk a mile in that person's shoes, you don't know what's going on. With that so instead of just thinking to yourself, she's weird, reach out to those people. Be compassionate. See what you can do. Somebody's sitting by themselves in the lunchroom. Somebody drops their papers all over, you know, the place. Um, stop and help them pick it up. Because you might be the person that's standing between them and, you know, a bad situation. And maybe you're the, the spark that keeps them going for one more day. <clears throat> Mary Webster just defines passion as sympathetic consciousness of others distressed together with the desire to alleviate. So in other words, we see somebody that's having an issue and we want to help. And that's what a good thing does. They reach out to help. Last thing is change. My challenge to you today is to be the change. And I have one more story to share with you, and that is about a young woman who went to her mom and told her how struggling she was just struggling. She was ready to end her life. She just couldn't take all of the troubles that her child was on. So her mom took her to the kitchen with three pots of water on the stove. And once she put carrots, and once she put eggs, and then once she put ground coffee. And after about 20 minutes, she took out the carrots, she took out the eggs, she, she ladled the coffee in two. She asked her daughter to peel the carrots, and she did, and they were soft. She asked her to crack the egg, and she did, and she noticed that it was hard to boil. And she asked her to taste the coffee. And the girl actually smiled, and she tasted it. How the it was. She said, what's the point of all this, Mom? And her mom explained to her that each of those three objects had faced the same adversity with boiling water. They had all had very different reactions. The carrots had gone in hard and come out soft and weak. The egg had gone in very fragile, but it had come out hard. But only the coffee was very unique because the coffee actually changed the water. So my challenge to you is to be that seventh seed, to be the change, and to be the person that makes a positive difference in other people's lives. It'll make you feel great, and it's a sign of a 